Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I guess is okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, okay, so I, I think it's about time to start. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I, I would like to welcome you guys uh, to join uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, so I believe it's a two hour uh, lecture topic uh, and the topic is about the basics and advances uh, in WebGIS. Uh, so we are going to mainly talk about uh, WebGIS and uh, later on I'm going to briefly uh, talk about myself, introduce myself. So I'm uh, Zhiyuan Huang. Uh, so before we start, actually, uh, I would like to uh, like uh, uh, like kind of like uh, tell you guys about some housekeeping items. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm not quite sure uh, my internet connection is stable enough uh, to like uh, to have all this smooth uh, like presentation. Uh, but however, um, well, if, if later on uh, I think uh, the internet connection is not good enough, uh, so uh, I will like turn off my webcam. Uh, so uh, like uh, we can save some uh, bandwidth. Uh, so. And and hopefully uh, the, everything uh, will go smoothly. And the other thing is, uh, if you find that I'm lagging or uh, uh, or the uh, a breakout for uh, like a, for a while, so uh, just leave some message over there, and then I believe I can see that. Uh, okay. So um, yeah, and I think that's just start. Okay. This is. Okay, okay, sure. All right, so uh, this is about me. Uh, so first of all, I'm Zhiyuan Huang. Uh, I'm currently uh, an associate uh, professor in uh, CSRSR, the Center for Space, uh, space, and, remote, uh, space and Remote Sensing Research, uh, and is uh, in the NCU, National Central University. Uh, so I have been well here for uh, like more than six years. Uh, so, and I'm also a charter member and editor of one of the international uh, open standard uh, for the IoT for the Internet of Things. And then uh, the, the standard uh, is actually called the OGC Sense of Things API. And uh, maybe later on, uh, we will, while well, some of the lecture topic, we'll cover it. And uh, my research interest is mainly on the uh, web GIS and also, for example, the geospatial web and, uh, and uh, the currently, the, in terms of the application, I'm interested in the uh, Internet of Things and uh, worldwide sense of web. So, uh, well, beside that, uh, beside the applications, uh, uh, we are uh, talking about, uh, we, we are like concerning about uh, the performance issue and scalability issue of the design and implementation of uh, WebGIS systems. So, uh, including uh, the spatial temporal data management and including uh, like the interoperability, which we are going to mention later. Uh, so, it's basically uh, some like brief uh, like introduction about myself. So, and later on today, uh, we are, uh, this is the outline uh, uh, today. Uh, so, first of all, we are going to introduce uh, GIS uh, from a computing perspective. And then uh, we are going to introduce uh, the web GIS and then, we, uh, and then followed by uh, some technology advances uh, in the web GIS. And we will introduce some topics, uh, including uh, web mapping, uh, geospatial web, and volunteer geographic information, uh, or in short, uh, VGI. Uh, LBS, uh, the location-based service, and uh, finally, the Internet of Things, uh, the IoT. So uh, while we are introducing uh, those uh, concepts and uh, some, of, uh, some of the, you can say, technology uh, details of them, uh, I'm also going to introduce a little bit of uh, what uh, my research group uh, was doing and then some research outcome uh, will share with you guys as well. So yeah, with no further ado, let's start. So first of all, uh, what I'm going, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the uh, GIS to review or introduce GIS from a computing perspective. Uh, so maybe uh, I believe uh, I actually I'm not entirely sure uh, what's the background of you guys, uh, but however, 
I believe uh, most of you treat uh, GIS as a tool, uh, as a system uh, allow you to uh, include some geospatial data and then uh, to visualize it, to present it, and also uh, to use some, uh, you can say, toolboxes or algorithms uh, to uh, analyze or uh, manipulate uh, those uh, geospatial data and to achieve uh, whatever you want to achieve uh, in terms of your domain uh, application. So uh, GIS, uh, for most of uh, people, uh, actually is a tool. But however, uh, this type of tool uh, is actually, uh, was actually created by someone or by some, uh, well, some team. Uh, so in this case, what I'm interested in, uh, in my research group, uh, actually we are uh, looking at GIS uh, in terms of how to design and also implement uh, a GIS uh, system. So uh, to be specific, uh, that means uh, in terms of GIS, uh, there are multiple functionalities uh, that, needs, uh, that uh, this system needs to support. And in, in order to support these type of uh, list, uh, functionalities, and uh, what are the software components that we need to implement, and how those uh, software components uh, communicate with each other uh, in a way that uh, they can exchange information. So, and also, we are uh, we uh, would like to discuss uh, the questions or the questions of uh, if you have a large amount of data and then how to handle or how to manage those data efficiently. Uh, so those are the um, well, you can say research questions that we are uh, well we are interested in. So uh, today, uh, I'm also want to uh, like share this type of. Um, you can say uh, perspective uh, to you guys, uh, because actually uh, not many courses uh, actually talks about GIS uh, from a computing perspective. And I hope today uh, we can uh, like briefly uh, introduce uh, this aspect. And beside that, uh, we are also going to introduce some fun and uh, advanced uh, topics uh, in GI related to uh, GIS. So let's start from the first, uh, like you can say section or topic. So um, let's quickly review uh, what the GIS uh, is. So I believe uh, from last week, uh, from Professor uh, Zhou, uh, actually I believe he introduced the 3S uh, technology and one of the uh, S, uh, the, one of the technology is the GIS, the uh, Geographic Information uh, System. And so I believe that you guys uh, should know uh, what GIS is. And in terms of the textbook uh, definition, so as you can see, and uh, a GIS system uh, is actually a computer-based information system. So uh, I believe many of you uh, should know uh, that uh, what in, uh, an information system is. So uh, basically an information system, uh, it supports uh, some functionalities uh, to deal with some uh, data. So uh, those functionalities uh, include, uh, for example, the capturing of the, uh, the data uh, or, link, uh, or the linkage uh, to the data source. So, uh, for example, uh, for the GIS, actually, uh, we are we can uh, this GIS system uh, could link to uh, some sensors, uh, some institute sensors uh, in the field, uh, some weather stations, or some uh, well, some uh, environment monitoring uh, stations, or it can link to some remote sensing uh, like uh, sources, uh, like the resource satellite or uh, like uh, airplanes. Uh, so those uh, sensors uh, contribute, um, uh, you can say, uh, sensor observations, and then uh, they will be integrated uh, to the GIS system. And so that's basically the first step or first functionality, the capturing. And then after you have those data, uh, then the next step or next functionality is uh, you can try to model uh, those data. You need to, actually, you need to model those data. So what does it mean by modeling? Modeling means that uh, when you have a certain data and or certain information, and in order to manage uh, that information or, uh, or process that information uh, in computers, uh, so you need to let uh, the computer to understand uh, what are the attributes of that uh, information. So for example, uh, if right now I want to store, uh, for example, students uh, information uh, uh, in, or you can say country information uh, in the GIS, in a GIS um, system, then in this case, uh, I need to identify what are the attributes of uh, those information. For example, uh, includes uh, the country's 
uh, name and also the polygon of the the boundary of the country and maybe uh, there are some areas of the uh, uh, of the country names uh, and also maybe uh, when does that country are uh, like uh, established uh, so the the years or the time and uh, also some maybe some like important milestones of that country so um, basically, uh, those are the attributes uh, you need to identify uh, so that you can manage those information in a computer system. So uh, that's the one of the important steps, uh, which is called modeling. So uh, and it's also one of the important feature or functionality of an uh, information system. So after you uh, model the information, then in this case, uh, you can uh, you can store uh, those data uh, in or manage those data in the computer. Uh, so in this case, this next um, step or next uh, functionality is the storage. So you can store those data in. Uh, usually, uh, we will store those data in databases. Uh, so and use a database management system uh, to manage those databases. And for the geospatial data uh, or for GIS data, uh, usually we are we are like geospatial. Uh, uh, well, we have geospatial attributes. So in this case, uh, those type of uh, databases uh, are called uh, the geos geospatial database or spatial database or geo database. Okay, so like uh, this graph uh, indicates uh, in the middle over here. So after you store those uh, information in the database, then uh, the next thing is uh, you can query uh, those data. So in terms of what are the criteria that you want to set and then to identify uh, the exact uh, data record that you, uh, that you need. So the next step uh, is the retrieval. Uh, it's the retrieval of those data. And after that, uh, after you retrieve it, uh, retrieve it then uh, well, maybe you can use some algorithm or some uh, like some manipulation uh, to process those data. So the next uh, functionality supported by information system uh, is the manipulation. So uh, you can, uh, for in terms of the GIS, uh, maybe you can use uh, like buffering uh, so, or uh, overlapping uh, or clip uh, or uh, they are. So basically, they are a lot of like algorithms that you can choose uh, to manipulate uh, those data. So that's the manipulation. And also, I believe, uh, like most of you uh, should have some knowledge uh, uh, about uh, like GIS softwares or GIS systems like ArcGIS or Quantum GIS. And they are, uh, they, they are a lot of toolbox uh, like uh, like tools uh, that uh, you can choose uh, to manipulate those data. So that's uh, also a, a part of the manipulation. And after you process the data, uh, then you may have some results. And then uh, what you can do is you can share with other people. So the data sharing uh, is also uh, one of the functionality uh, provided by information system. And finally, uh, the presentation of those uh, data of, or, or of those uh, processed results uh, is also one of the functionality. And in terms of the GIS, uh, it could be in uh, like displayed uh, in the 2D view or uh, 3D view. Um, or well, you can say uh, nowadays uh, there are a lot of visualization, uh, new visualization technology, and allow you to like um, have a more immersive uh, experience. Uh, for example, like the AR augmented reality, like the VR virtual reality. Those technologies uh, allows you to uh, have a more intuitive and uh, immersive experience. Okay, so uh, basically this is the textbook uh, definition of a GIS system. And so I believe uh, most of you should know it, uh, or is especially uh, when you, uh, after you attend uh, the Professor Joe's uh, like lecture last week. Okay, so, uh, and then, uh, so based on this uh, textbook, uh, based on these uh, uh, like brief uh, introduction to a GIS system. So uh, you can think about, say, our topic is about uh, viewing GIS from a computing perspective. So which means that uh, we are not looking at this system from a user point of view. Instead, uh, we are looking at this system from a developer point of view. So if right now I'm a developer, I'm a software developer, I want to create uh, this GIS system, then uh, this system needs to support each of those uh, functionalities over here and how I'm going to design uh, how I'm going to design this uh, like system uh, in terms of their software components and then how they exchange information. Then that's uh, the that's another you can say um, domain of study uh, to in the in the GIS domain. 
Okay. So uh, here, in terms of uh, this like perspective, uh, viewing GIS from a computing perspective, then there are many uh, necessary knowledge that uh, we should like we should learn. Uh, so including, uh, first of all, uh, is the fundamental spatial concept. And uh, uh, the, so because uh, you need to understand what uh, geometry is and what, wh what are the spaces uh, that, uh, what are different types of space that we could use uh, to describe the, the data. So for example, like Euclidean uh, space or uh, the topological space and uh, what are their relationships uh, in, uh, what are the relationship between uh, geometries uh, in different spaces. So first, uh, that's what we need to learn, uh, what we need to know. And after based, and based on that knowledge, and then we can start uh, talking about how to model those uh, geospatial information uh, in a computer system. So uh, the second part uh, could be the models of the geospatial information. And uh, I believe uh, for most of you, uh, actually, I believe Professor Joe uh, talked about it uh, last week. So I believe he mentioned uh, there are two models. Uh, one is the vector uh, data, and the other one is the raster data. So uh, here we are using different uh, terms uh, to call them. Uh, one is called the, uh, the object model, and the other one is the field model. Uh, actually, they, are co they correspond to the vector data and also vector model or the raster model. So object uh, model means uh, the by using the point, line, polygon, those vector types of uh, representation uh, to uh, like to 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 model those information. And field model uh, means you uh, it's using like the field uh, like the uh, raster types of data uh, to represent uh, the geo uh, geospatial information. So uh, these models are based, uh, also based on uh, the fundamental spatial concept as well. And after that, after you have this, uh, after the, uh, you have the models, and then uh, we can start talking about what are the representations uh, of those data uh, in the computer system, and then how does them, uh, well, how, how, how do they affect uh, the performance uh, when you are executing some algorithms? Uh, so that's another, you can say, um, topic that needs to be uh, discussed. So uh, for example, uh, they are, uh, for example, computational geometry uh, algorithms, and then uh, the topological uh, data models and algorithms and team model and uh, different types of uh, algorithms that can be discussed over here. And by uh, representing uh, the data in a different way, then uh, you, the, algor the algorithm may have different uh, performance. So uh, that's, you can say, uh, and a, a big topic uh, uh, can be talked about over here. And then uh, after that, uh, in terms of um, constructing uh, the GIS system, uh, one of the foundation uh, to a GIS system uh, is the database, uh, is the database. So because all the data, most of the data are uh, managed in the database, uh, so uh, and controlled by a database management system. So some fundamental database concepts uh, needs to be discussed as well. And so including uh, the relational algebra and UML, uh, UML uh, modeling and also the query language uh, to the database. So these are also some important and necessary uh, knowledge uh, uh, when you are discussing uh, the database. But however, uh, the general database is not enough uh, for a GIS system uh, because GIS uh, is handling geospatial data. So which means that the data is usually multi-dimensional. So uh, it could be two-dimensional like the latitude and longitude. Uh, it could be three-dimensional including the altitude and it could be like uh, four-dimensional, including the time, for example. And uh, if you want uh, to treat other attributes as different dimensions, and then we have much more dimensions uh, than, uh, than we know. So in this case, uh, for a computer uh, system, uh, computer system uh, is constructed uh, by using zero and one. Uh, so this like binary, zero, one, zero, one. So computer system is efficient uh, in terms of managing one dimensional data. For example, like uh, uh, just an, uh, a numerical uh, array of data or is a time, uh, different time point. Uh, so computer is efficient uh, in managing those data. But however, uh, to manage multi-dimensional data, uh, computer system uh, is not so efficient. 
So in this case, uh, some additional um, design needs to be applied. Uh, for example, like the spatial access methods are, are uh, introduced. Uh, for example, B tree, B, uh, B plus tree, quad tree, R tree, those index uh, methods uh, needs to be uh, introduced. Uh, and finally, uh, the architecture to design and uh, model uh, the whole system. So, like I said, uh, how many? Uh, what are the system? Uh, what are the software modules that uh, you need uh, for the GIS system, and then how they co uh, connect uh, with each other? Uh, is it a centralized uh, uh, system? Is it a decentralized system? Uh, this is also some of the uh, you can say um, knowledge that needs to be learned. Okay. So uh, in general, uh, in order to uh, like study uh, GIS from a computer perspective, and these are some necessary knowledge that needs to be discussed. But however, uh, uh, of course, uh, as, we, uh, as you know, uh, we only have two hours. Uh, so uh, it's not possible for us to touch all the details over here. So I'm going to uh, introduce uh, one of the most important topic, uh, in my personal opinion, for a beginner. Uh, uh, so uh, which is the architecture. So later on, we are going to discuss the architecture uh, well in a little bit detail. Uh, but however, for other parts, uh, we don't have the time to talk about that. Uh, but if you are interested in it, uh, so feel free to look into uh, any of the details uh, like online or you can send me emails at later on. So, uh, or you can say uh, these slides uh, is to kind of like scare you guys uh, say, okay, if you really want to uh, like become a software developer uh, to uh, invent, uh, to create uh, a GIS system, then uh, there are a lot of things uh, to study. Okay, so like I said, uh, we are going to talk about the architecture uh, because uh, in my personal opinion, uh, if you are a new uh, a beginner uh, in terms of uh, like viewing GIS from a computing perspective, uh, then uh, as long as you can uh, learn the architecture first, then uh, you can try to analyze or try to guess how an existing system works. For example, uh, later on, maybe we can talk about some, uh, for example, Google Map. Uh, Google Map is one of the uh, like uh, the GIS system or web GIS system, and um, well, and a lot, and most of you, uh, I believe, all of you know uh, knows Google Map. And then, but however, did you like uh, try to think about how exactly does Google uh, achieve those functionalities on Google Map? For example, uh, there are many functionalities provided by Google Maps. Uh, for example, it provides you uh, like uh, the the maps. And in a very uh, like efficient way, uh, when you zoom in uh, to any places uh, in the world, and then it can it can show you uh, the map efficiently, and also uh, it can uh, help you to, for example, uh, to perform some navigation. Uh, so, and how does Google uh, achieve those navigation? Uh, and uh, when you uh, what kind of uh, request did you send uh, to Google? And then how does Google uh, like uh, change it according to the traffic condition? So those are the functionality provided by Google Map. But however, uh, they they uh, Google needs to implement it uh, so that uh, users can ut utilize it. So. Uh, if you know uh, the architecture, then uh, in, to some uh, to to a certain degree, uh, you can try to imagine or try to uh, guess how exactly does Google achieve that. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, we are going to introduce the architecture, and one of the most uh, important architecture, in my personal opinion, uh, is uh, the three tier architecture. Uh, is the three T architecture, and so basically, uh, this could be one of the most important slides uh, today. So, uh, and this three T architecture can be utilized uh, to um, model uh, to represent uh, any types of uh, information system. Okay, so what are the three tiers? So these three tiers are, are includes uh, the data tier, application logic tier, and also the presentation tier. So, uh, or you can treat them as three different layers. All right, data, data layer, application logic layer, and the presentation layer. So, and here I'm going to use uh, the uh, one, uh, like some distributed, uh, distributed uh, web GIS system as an example. So uh, what exactly does the uh, data tier uh, like do? Or what's the responsibility uh, of the uh, data tier? 
So the data tier is in charge of uh, collecting uh, the data or uh, producing uh, those geospatial data. Uh, so for example, you can link to uh, some data sources like the institute sensors, some buoys, uh, some weather stations, or you can link to uh, some uh, like remote sensors uh, like, uh, like sat resource satellite or uh, like aircraft. Uh, so, and that's one of the functionality provided by the data tier, it generates uh, data. And, but however, after you generate those data in the field, and then you need to, uh, in, you, you need to in charge of uh, like transmitting uh, those data back to uh, your data server. And so the transmission, the data transmission is also one of the like responsibility in the data tier. And then uh, after you transmit uh, those data or collect those data uh, in the data server, you need to manage those data, uh, manage those different uh, types of data. It could be uh, like you can say a video, uh, an image, or it could be like uh, just sensor readings. So different uh, types of data needs to be managed uh, in the data server. So the, the data management uh, is also one of the responsibility uh, to the data tier. So, after that, as you can see, I'm using a cloud uh, here. The cloud indicates uh, the, uh, in, in the background, uh, I'm using a cloud in the background, and that cloud indicates a uh, web, or it indicates uh, the web. So uh, after you uh, like store those, uh, store and manage those data uh, in the web, uh, in some data servers, then uh, you can, uh, in the data, in the application logic tier, uh, you can construct some application servers and then to uh, collect the uh, data from different data servers. And then uh, aco according to uh, the, yeah, according to, uh, you can say, uh, the application um, purpose. So uh, for, for example, if right now I want to uh, do some, uh, you can say fire uh, evacuation system, uh, then in this case, I need some uh, like, uh, you can say some, some data of the like smoke uh, readings and some data in terms of some air temperature uh, readings. Uh, and they could be uh, located in different server and I can uh, send the request and to collect those data from different places on the, on the, uh, on the web. So after I include them, uh, after I retrieve them, and then I can process them uh, uh, in terms of uh, according to my application logic. So that means uh, that's the also uh, indicates the term application logic. So uh, you can say the application logic uh, is the brain, uh, is the, the all the logic and all the ideas uh, that needs to be uh, implemented. And after that, uh, finally, the third tier uh, or final uh, layer is the print presentation uh, tier. So after you process those data and then those results uh, can be, needs to be transmitted uh, to users. Uh, so the user will be using some application client uh, to like receive or to uh, visualize uh, those data. And by using uh, different uh, types of device, uh, could be a laptop, could be a PC, could be a mobile phone, so, uh, so the presentation tier uh, is in charge of the visualization, or is in charge of the uh, retrieval of the result and also uh, the visualization. Okay, so uh, basically this is the three-tier architecture. So um, basically uh, these three-tier architecture can be used uh, to like model any types of uh, information system. And because GIS uh, is also one of the information system, so we can use this architecture to uh, model uh, GIS system as well. Okay, so um, this is like kind of like the first step uh, to understand uh, uh, GIS uh, computing perspective. But however, if right now you want, we want to uh, like take a step further uh, to understand, uh, to imagine, say, if you are a software developer and then right now you want to create a GIS system to support uh, the, uh, the idea or uh, to, uh, to realize the logic of your application, then in this case, um, what are the possible challenges uh, in each of the tiers? That's actually uh, is uh, what we think. What we, that's uh, actually what we uh, think every day uh, in terms of, my, or you can say, uh, my research background. So uh, because we want to design and implement uh, GIS systems, and then uh, according to our uh, some of our design, uh, some of our ideas, then in this case, um, we when we try to uh, achieve uh, our requirements, and then uh, we need to identify uh, for different uh, layers uh, what are the challenges. So just uh, 
in the data here, maybe uh, there's one uh, challenge that we need to consider, which is maybe we are going to uh, like uh, deploy some sensors in the field. Uh, and uh, for example, if right now I want to monitor uh, the, um, you can say, rice uh, production, then in this case, uh, I want to uh, deploy some sensors uh, to monitor the, uh, the soil moisture and uh, the soil temperature and uh, maybe the like solar radiation in the rice field. Then in this case, uh, there are some challenges uh, that need to, needs to be considered, uh, including, for example, like the power supply. Because you are going to deploy sensors uh, in the fields, then the power supply becomes one issue. And uh, also, uh, if, if the sensor is, um, how, can, how can we uh, make, this, uh, make the sensor uh, cheaper and so that we can deploy more sensors? So that's uh, the production uh, cost uh, is also one of the challenge as well. And after you deploy those sensors, then the next challenge uh, could be uh, how to transmit uh, those data back to your data server. For example, like the protocol, what's the protocol that you want to use and what's the transmission range? For example, if the sensor is close by uh, in, um, in the, for example, in your house, then uh, maybe you can use the Wi-Fi. But however, uh, if you are uh, uh, deploy sensors uh, in the field, uh, then uh, in this case, uh, perhaps in the, in the field, uh, perhaps uh, uh, you need to use a communication protocol that can cover a wider range. So that's also one of the ch uh, uh, some challenges that need to come be, needs to be considered. And in terms of the data tier, uh, you also need to manage the data. Uh, so the differences between the data model, for example, like uh, different uh, uh, how how uh, the for example different types of data uh, needs to be uh, modeled uh, in terms of their different attributes and how to model it and then how to uh, apply some indexes uh, to make the management uh, more efficiently. And that's also one of the challenges needs to be considered. And in terms of the application logic tier, uh, so because the application logic tier uh, handles the execution or processing of those process of those data. So uh, in this case, uh, what kind of algorithm that you are going to use? And then uh, if you face the problem of big data, uh, a lot of data, a large amount of data, then how to execute those uh, algorithms uh, efficiently uh, by using, for example, like um, uh, multi-thread uh, processing or uh, you can say uh, parallel processing technology, then in this case, that's some of the challenge that you need to think from a software uh, engineering, uh, software engineer point of view. And finally, the presentation tier. Uh, so for example, uh, you need to uh, like retrieve the data from the application server. So what's the data format uh, that you are getting? And then how to like, uh, which, uh, which format uh, is more efficient and can transmit the data quickly? And how to uh, provide, how to design and provide a, good, a better user experience, uh, which means the UX, UI and UX uh, design. So that the users uh, will, will, will uh, find that your application is easy to use and efficient uh, to use. So those are the possible, uh, just a fragment, uh, like a small uh, fragment of the challenges that are uh, usually considered uh, when you are designing JS uh, from a computer's perspective. Okay. Okay. So like I said, this slide is kind of like uh, one of the most important slides uh, today. Uh, so hopefully you can understand uh, the content over here. So, and also because uh, we have a lot of content uh, to introduce uh, to you. Uh, so I'm going to move on. And uh, if you have any question, uh, maybe we can discuss later on. Okay, so, and I will just stop over there from, for the first, uh, you can say, uh, topic, uh, which is uh, like G introducing GIS from a computing perspective. Uh, like I said, we don't have that much time to talk about uh, everything in detail. So I introduced one of the most important thing, which is the architect architecture of the GI uh, of a GIS. So uh, which is the three D architecture. Okay. So later on, let's dig into another detail, uh, which is the introduction to WebGIS. So. Because today oh, we are going to talk about GI, uh, web GIS. So, and because right uh, earlier we we review and introduce the GIS, and then right now, what exactly is uh, web GIS? So, uh, web GIS is actually quite easy to understand, but as long as your GIS system has any components of web, then uh, you uh, basically you, are, you can basically treat your system as the, com the combination or integration between the web and also the GIS. So that becomes a GIS system. So 
the definition is quite broad. Uh, it's quite uh, like flexible and broad. Uh, so that means uh, as long as any uh, components, any software components uh, or any data that you are using are from the uh, web, then you can call it GI web GIS. So, and why web GIS is important? Uh, because uh, by like you can say benefit uh, from the web, uh, the web GIS actually has a lot of uh, very, uh, you can say important characteristics. So for example, one of that is uh, it has a global reach. So uh, when you like create a, uh, a web GIS system, then uh, because it's on the web, so uh, you have a global reach, uh, you can reach to uh, everyone on the, uh, well, in this, uh, like everywhere, as long as there is a web connection or as an internet connection. So you can reach to like every place, uh, ev everywhere uh, in the world. And the other thing is, is cross-platform. Uh, so uh, doesn't matter, sometimes uh, some software that cannot be used uh, in different um, uh, operating systems. For example, Mac uh, or uh, Windows or Linux. So uh, sometimes uh, they are, uh, it's, it's not uh, compatible uh, uh, in terms of some softwares. But however, uh, in terms of WebGIS, because it's based on the web, uh, based on the platform of the web. So uh, different types of uh, operating system or different types of uh, devices, uh, most of them, uh, like 99.999%, uh, they support the web connection. So in this case, uh, it achieves a cross-platform uh, capability. And then large, um, large number of users. Uh, so you have a lot of exposure uh, to utilize your WebGIS system. And low cost on average, because you have a large number of user base. Uh, so the cost that you uh, that, that took on average uh, is getting much lower. And usually WebGIS systems are easy to use. Of course, they once upon a time, there are some not so easy to use a WebGIS system. Uh, but however, is um, you can say, uh, uh, well, people are not using that, uh, uh, or you can say uh, most people don't th doesn't need that. So uh, most of the uh, current or popular WebGIS systems are uh, they are easy to use. And finally, uh, unified update. Uh, this is quite an important um, characteristic, you can say, uh, because uh, when you are a software developer, uh, then you should know that uh, bugs happens everywhere, or have, it always happens. Uh, so in this case, uh, you need to fix something uh, from time to time. And uh, as long as it's a web system, then uh, you can directly change anything uh, on your, uh, you can say, on, on the backend uh, to, uh, to your system, to your application. Then uh, suddenly, uh, you, everyone is using the up-to-date, uh, uh, you can say, a version of your application. So the unified update is also one important uh, characteristic to the WebGIS. OK, and then, uh, again, <laughs> architecture. So uh, the WebGIS architecture is actually, um, you can say, well, we can view the uh, WebGIS architecture from a different point of view uh, in terms of the communication point of view. So for example, uh, the simple as WebGIS uh, system uh, it can have, uh, you can say a server and that server has uh, a URL on, uh, on the web. So uh, which is an address uh, to locate uh, this server. And usually the server, uh, especially WebGIS uh, server, usually contains a database. Uh, DB means the database. And then the other thing is uh, on the other end, uh, we have the client. And the client uh, will use different types of, uh, you can say, platform. And so how exactly do they communicate with each other? So they are, through, they are transmitting through the uh, internet or through the web. So uh, just uh, j the simplest architecture, right? So the client can initialize, uh, in, uh, initialize a, a HTTP request and then send uh, the request uh, to the server by, uh, by using the URL of the server. And then, uh, then after the server received the request, then uh, it will try to understand the request uh, in terms of what's the data that the client needs and uh, what's the process uh, that the client needs, uh, wants to execute. And the server will reach uh, to the database and to get the data and then uh, to do some processing and then uh, send back to the HTTP, uh, HTTP response uh, to the client. And after the client receives uh, the, uh, the response, then you can parse uh, the information out of uh, the HTTP response and then display it uh, to, uh, the, uh, to, to, the, to the user. 
Okay, so this is the simplest uh, web G, uh, web GIS uh, architecture. Uh, you can say from the communication point of view. So we still sep we separate it into uh, client and server, and all the uh, you can say most of the web GIS uh, system uh, is just the communication between the client server client server. Client send the request to server and server uh, analyze and process the request and then send back the response to the client. And client receive it and then parse the information and display it to the user. So uh, that's the simplest WebGIS architecture. Okay, but still, as you can see, uh, this, uh, even, even for this architecture, uh, we can still kind of like um, separate it into uh, three tiers. For example, the database uh, could be the data tier, and uh, the server uh, could be the application logic tier, and client could be the pre presentation tier. Okay, okay. So uh, let's move on. So that's kind of like the very brief um, introduction to the WebGIS, uh, and then uh, later on we are going to touch some new or let, uh, some some related uh, and also uh, new advances related to the WebGIS. Uh, and uh, we are going to introduce five uh, different uh, technology advances. One, uh, the first, uh, including uh, web mapping, GeoWeb, geospatial web, and uh, the volunteer geographic information, the VGI, and location-based service. And then uh, finally, we will spend uh, a little bit more time on the uh, Internet of Things, the IoT. Okay. So let's just continue then. So the first uh, that uh, we are going to talk about is the web mapping. So uh, why we start from the web mapping? Uh, so one of the reason uh, for that uh, is um, most of the time, actually, um, but to most people, actually WebGIS um, is kind of like putting uh, the map on the uh, on the web, putting a map on the web, and then uh, you can uh, display the map, and then you can zoom in, zoom out, or you can overlay some data on the map, and then for different uh, domain application, domain purpose. So um, in this case, uh, most of the time, uh, people will treat a web mapping uh, or uh, web mapping as the WebGIS. But however, hopefully, uh, today after the, after the lecture, uh, that you should, uh, you should and uh, hopefully you can understand that uh, the WebGIS is much more than uh, just putting maps on the web, okay? It's much more than web, just web mapping. There are different other ways or different other, um, you can say, uh, representation or, um, uh, or uh, applications uh, of WebGIS. Okay, okay. So, but however, let's start from the web mapping, uh, which is like commonly uh, like uh, understood by most people. So uh, we can just start from one of the question, and which actually I just mentioned earlier. Uh, if you if I ask you to think about what's the most famous uh, WebGIS application, then I believe like uh, ninety like ninety nine percent of you uh, will say by Google Map. Google Map uh, is probably the, uh, you can say, uh, the most famous uh, WebGIS application. So, uh, and then the next thing what I wanted to say is uh, Google Map, Google Earth, uh, sure. Uh, uh, Google Earth is one as well, but however, Google Map is, uh, could be more popular, uh, or but yeah, could be more popular uh, to most people. Uh, so uh, the Google, Google Map, uh, you can say uh, Google Map is actually a uh, uh, um, web mapping. Uh, it's a web mapping uh, system, uh, and then so uh, and in terms of the web mapping, uh, it, Google Map also supports other functionalities. For example, uh, you can display some point of interest on the uh, on the map, or there are some, uh, for example, like uh, some uh, photos uh, that are geo coded, and then uh, you can uh, display uh, those photos on the map as well. And then uh, you can, on the Google map, you can also search for place names, uh, street address, and then uh, they, uh, Google map can help you to uh, pinpoint where that is on the map uh, to you. And, oh, and also you can uh, like overlay some of the data, some of the geospatial on the map. So those functionalities uh, actually are covered uh, here uh, in terms of some process over here. So first of all, uh, the web mapping uh, is specifically uh, in terms of how to uh, create map uh, and share maps on the web. So later on, we will talk about that. And then some of the process, uh, including the geotagging, geocoding, geoparsing, uh, that uh, are also some of the procedures provided by uh, Google Map. And finally, MapMeshop is also one 
per, uh, one functionality. So, uh, like I said, uh, we can try to uh, think about how exactly does Google Map uh, achieve those functionalities. So, first of all, uh, the web mapping. So web mapping uh, is a process of design, implementing, generating, and delivering uh, maps uh, on the web. So uh, the, in general, uh, uh, in the past, uh, cartography uh, was like, uh, like only restrict uh, to some professionals uh, by using some expensive uh, tools or, uh, or hardware uh, to create those beautiful maps. Uh, but however, uh, when you uh, like, uh, when you have the some uh, more and more uh, tools uh, and freely available data on the web, then with the geospatial web or with the web GIS, then the web mapping uh, start uh, can benefit uh, from the freely available uh, mapping technology and geospatial data, uh, so that everyone uh, they are uh, like they can easily produce maps and the uh, uh, easy transfer of geospatial data and also allow uh, users uh, to create uh, the different types of maps. So uh, that's, uh, well, that's why web mapping becomes uh, much more important or much more uh, user-friendly or producer-friendly uh, to create uh, different types of data. So for example, uh, anyone can uh, collect some open data, for example, like uh, some healthcare uh, map or some PN 2.5 map uh, by using the open data online. Uh, and after you retrieve those data, and then you can do some process, uh, some easy process and create map and then share it or overlay it on the web mapping systems. So, and there are many tools allow you to achieve that. Uh, and some of them, they are commercial tools, uh, kind of commercial tools, uh, like Google Mapping Maps and uh, here, Nokia here. And, but however, some of the web mapping systems, uh, they are, uh, you can say, open source uh, and free. Uh, so uh, two of the most famous ones are the open layers and leaflet. And both of them, they are pretty good uh, web mapping systems. Uh, they are efficient and they provide uh, many functionalities and they have a pretty active uh, and large, uh, you can say, um, community. So if you are, um, well, if you want to build your uh, own like uh, map uh, on the web, then in this case, uh, you can consider using open layers or leaflet. Okay, and but however, let's talk about one of the first uh, functionality provided by Google Map, uh, which is allow you to see the map, right? So, but however, there's one, uh, well, uh, so how exactly does Google uh, share those uh, maps uh, to you? So originally, uh, the data still from the raw data, it could be a vector data, uh, it could be the raster data, and then you need a web mapping server to produce, uh, to render those maps uh, for you. And then uh, you can uh, like uh, transmit those maps uh, to the web mapping client. But however, uh, how to transmit uh, those uh, maps uh, to the client from the server? So as you can imagine, um, uh, on Google Map, we can zoom in and zoom out to any places uh, in, in, on the world. Uh, and then uh, the high-resolution high uh, satellite images or high-resolution uh, area photos uh, can be displayed uh, in a very efficient way. So how exactly does it uh, achieve it? How exactly does a Google Map achieve such uh, high uh, efficiency? Uh, so you can consider, for example, like one uh, like satellite image uh, could be larger, uh, like uh, well, four, few meter, uh, like one meter resolution image. Uh, it could be uh, or like uh, fifty uh, centimeter resolution image satellite images. Uh, it could be reached to like two to three gigabytes of uh, of the data. So. Of course, uh, it's not possible to train every time when you zoom in and zoom in to any places and uh, it downloads uh, like uh, two to three uh, gigabytes of data and display it on your uh, like on your machine on your cell phone, for example. So it's not possible to achieve that. So how exactly does the Google Map uh, achieve it? So uh, it's actually based on a certain. I believe many, uh, some of you uh, may heard about it. Uh, Google utilize uh, uh, this. Uh, system, uh, which is called a web map tile system. So uh, let's just assume that uh, this is one of the original map, uh, which is like mosaicing uh, like 30 centimeter resolution images of the whole world together. So uh, this map must be like petabyte uh, or even uh, or, or even larger zettabytes of data. So the original map uh, is not possible to be transmitted across the internet. So in this case, how exactly does 
Google achieve such high efficiency uh, when uh, like retrieving and displaying the data, the maps. So they are two, you can say kind of like two uh, different um, design uh, or two different ideas over here. The first idea is uh, to generalize it. For example, um, well, if right now I'm looking at the like very the whole globe, if I'm looking at the whole world, then in this case I don't need the detail. Or I don't need the high like the, like the thirty centimeter resolution images. I can generalize it to a very small uh, map, and I, I can directly transmit that small images uh, to the client side. Then uh, the transmission will be efficient. Uh, then uh, then then uh, if I then in this case, and I'm if I'm zooming a little bit, then I can uh, transmit the level two image. If I want to have a little bit more detail. Uh, then I can uh, transmit to the level three uh, images. But however, uh, it's, uh, this type of generalization is not enough. Uh, it's not entirely solve the problem. So uh, the level, uh, for example, when you're really zooming to like a very, very local area, you still eventually need to uh, transmit the, uh, the original map uh, to your client side. And in this case, that's not, that's not possible. So, how does Google uh, solve it? Is by using the web map tile system. Now, so that tile system uh, is actually using uh, some types of uh, like quad tree, uh, like quad tree structure. So uh, a quad tree means that uh, everything is divided by four. Uh, four uh, so for example, like, uh, okay, so here are some explanation over here. So uh, this uh, web map tile system, for example, for the level one, it cut it into four uh, tiles for small uh, images and give it a, an ID, you can say, sorry, give it an ID, for example, zero, one, two, three. And then if you zoom into the level two, uh, then these two, the coverage of the two will be split, will be split into the two, zero, two, one, two, 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 three. And if you keep zooming, then uh, for example, one, three will be uh, like cut it into four and it will have one, three, zero, one, three, one, one, three, two, and one, three, three. So, and, so that means when users zoom into this region, uh, for example, uh, this East uh, Asia region, uh, the client side, the, the web mapping system client side will identify and say, okay, so right now your uh, screen only looks at uh, this region. So that means uh, you are interested in this region. So I only need to trans transmit one, two, three, four, uh, these four images uh, to you. And that's enough because you don't need other uh, regions. You don't need the maps of other regions. You only need to transmit these four. So in this case, uh, the transmission, uh, data transmission can be uh, very, very uh, like efficient. And also you, uh, uh, like you can exclude a lot of unnecessary uh, transmissions. So this type of design popularized by Google and then, uh, and then other types of maps, web mapping systems uh, follow, uh, follow Google's uh, step and then uh, they, uh, they utilize uh, this web map uh, tile system. Okay, so um, some explanation over here, uh, you can take a look by yourself. Uh, so basically uh, this is how Google revolutionized uh, the web mapping systems. So some people will say um, Google actually uh, create uh, the uh, this is the third uh, revolution uh, in uh, the third generation of the web mapping system. The first generation is the static map and the second generation is an interactive map and the third generation is the uh, efficient uh, map and there's the fourth generation uh, of the web mapping system uh, which is uh, more dimensional, a 3D map you can say. So that's uh, the well one of the functionality provided by Google Map. Okay, then this is how exactly uh, they did it. And uh, so in terms of from the system architecture point of view, uh, well, the web mapping server will create uh, new tiles and then uh, store in the uh, map tile cache and uh, the client uh, will go to the map tile cache to get those map tiles. So just uh, get, uh, uh, retrieve uh, those tiles that the client uh, needs to uh, load. Okay, so this, is, uh, this becomes uh, the entire uh, web mapping system architecture. So, and uh, if you are interested in uh, like constructing your own web mapping system uh, uh, from the database, uh, from the, to the server, to the client, then uh, there are some open source tools uh, that you can take a look. For example, in terms of the database, uh, you could use uh, the PostGIS or PostgreSQL database. And in terms of the web mapping server, uh, the GeoServer is a, a pretty uh, handy uh, tool. 
And then in terms of the web mapping client, uh, open layers or leaflets, uh, they are quite uh, good uh, web mapping systems uh, and also they are free. Okay, so this is just uh, for your information. And for these two pages, uh, the following two pages uh, is uh, actually talk about uh, the, um, you can say, time and also computation intensive uh, map uh, rendering uh, issue uh, for web mapping system. Uh, but however, because of the time, uh, I want I would like to skip this. Uh, so it, I don't I don't want to talk about detail over here. I just want to like share this uh, to you. Uh, so basically, uh, what I want to say is that. The map tile generation, uh, the rendering is very time consuming. It's very, very time consuming. And it's not possible to use just one computer to uh, generate all the, web, uh, the, all the map types. So in this case, how exactly uh, does those big components or how does that, how, how, how does it uh, possible for you uh, to create those uh, maps? Uh, so basically uh, you could utilize uh, some of the tools and then they use um, parallel computing. Uh, so, for example, Google, uh, they, this is the architecture, uh, uh, sorry, this is the workflow that how Google, uh, like, actually, uh, how Google actually generate uh, those map tiles. And uh, I believe some of you may heard uh, about one uh, parallel computing framework, uh, which is called the Map Reduce. Uh, that is that was uh, like you can say proposed by Google. So as, as you can see uh, here is the map for face, and then uh, here is the reduced face. So um, we are not we don't have the time to talk about the detail. But however, uh, you, you can just uh, I'll try to understand this as uh, it is a parallel computing uh, procedure. Right? It's a parallel computing proce uh, procedure to create uh, different uh, map tiles. Okay, so by using uh, a lot of uh, multi-threads and also a lot of computers, then you can create map tiles uh, in parallel. So that the maps uh, can be created uh, efficiently. Okay, okay. So like I said, I want to stop over here and then I, uh, let's move on to the uh, other content uh, because we have a lot. Okay, and then uh, the next part uh, is about uh, geotagging. Uh, geotagging is a process uh, of adding uh, like uh, some geographic uh, data, uh, geographic information uh, to some media. Uh, for example, some uh, video or some uh, photograph and some other things, uh, for example, SMS uh, messages. Uh, so the idea of uh, the, the process of geotagging is to tag or to add geospatial attribute to a certain uh, data set. So the, that, the process of that is called geotagging. And this is uh, the Flickr, uh, like uh, you can say Flickr uh, website. And Flickr is, a, uh, you can say, a place that uh, allow you to share your uh, like kind of like professional uh, photographs. And then uh, there's a certain page uh, that, uh, as you can see, as you can know that of the uh, photos, uh, they can embed with uh, coordinates. Uh, so in this case, uh, when you display those uh, geocoded photo on the map, uh, you can uh, you can display that on the like correct precision. Uh, so Flickr also has uh, uh, this type of uh, attribute, uh, this type of functionality. So you can see uh, those geocoded photos on the map, and then by using their latitude and longitude embedded uh, latitude and longitude uh, coordinates. Okay, so that's the process of geotagging. Uh, by having the geotagging, then you can uh, have those uh, point of interest on the Google map. And geocoding, uh, so the, geo the process of the geocoding is actually people use that a lot. So uh, which means that uh, you are finding uh, the associate uh, coordinates from geographic data. For example, like uh, if you enter uh, a certain address, uh, street address on Google map and then click enter, then Suddenly, magically, uh, you can move uh, your uh, like uh, map to that certain location to pinpoint uh, that lets you and longitude on the map, or you can like input a certain place name. Uh, for example, uh, let's just say Taipei 101. Uh, so after you input the Taipei 101 building, uh, then uh, like click enter, then uh, suddenly uh, the, the Google Maps knows where Taipei 101 is. So how how does Google achieve that? How does Google uh, does Google remember all the mapping between each of the street address to the cor uh, corresponding latitude and longitude? 
in reality, of course, that's one way to do it. Uh, first of all, uh, if you ask me uh, the like the real answer, uh, well, I don't know the real answer. I'm not working for uh, working for Google, so uh, I don't know the real answer. But however, uh, supposedly uh, they do some, some something like that. But however, they change it uh, to some uh, something more efficiently. We can say. And one of the uh, one one of the procedure is uh, called the okay? one of the procedure is called the address interpolation. Uh, address interpolation. For example, uh, what you can do is uh, you can uh, understand uh, the street address uh, in terms of, uh, for example, the, the the beginning and the ending of the street, and you can record the latitude and longitude of these two points. And you know that uh, the uh, the left hand side is the even number, and right hand side is the odd number from one hundred to like uh, one ninety nine. So in this case, right now, if the user inputs uh, a certain uh, street address, uh, for example, one four one Main Street, so in this case, uh, we can perform the uh, the address interpolation because we know that one four one is between these is on this street, and then we can try to int interpolate uh, the location of one four one by using these two latitude and longitude. And so that after the inter interpolation, then we know that okay, so maybe it's over here. And if I have the knowledge uh, that the odd number uh, is on the right hand side of the street, then I can slightly move uh, the uh, final result to the right hand side a little bit uh, so that uh, you can have a more precise uh, location. Of course, uh, this uh, address interpolation uh, it has certain assumption, uh, which is the addresses on these uh, streets are evenly distributed. So they are, you can guarantee that uh, there are some certain uncertainty uh, exist. Okay? But however, in this case, uh, instead of uh, storing all the uh, like street address and their corresponding latitude and longitude, uh, you can save a lot of uh, space, uh, a lot of storage that you need uh, to take on the uh, server. Okay? And also vice versa. Uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, so this is basically the geocoding uh, to find the coordinates uh, from uh, street address or uh, postal code or uh, uh, the place names. But and vice versa, uh, there's something called reverse in, uh, reverse uh, geocoding. The reverse geocoding is kind of like when you click on the uh, uh, when you click on Google Map, and then uh, the Google Map can tell you what's the street address over there, and that's kind of like the geo, uh, reverse geocoding. Uh, so yeah, the vice versa, right? Okay, so this is the geocoding. The next is the geoparsing. So uh, the geoparsing is one interesting uh, procedure. So sometimes, uh, so basically, uh, let's just say, uh, geoparsing is to find and assign uh, geographic coordinates uh, from or to unstructured uh, textual words or phrases. So let's just give you guys an example. So first of all, uh, right now, if uh, if I want if I have a vacation and I want to uh, find a flight uh, from uh, from London to Paris, and then in this case, I want to uh, see when uh, when can I have the uh, when is that when is the flight uh, from one place uh, to another place. So geoparsing means that Google wants to understand uh, the meaning. Uh, Google wants to understand the meaning of this query. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, um, this is an uh, un unstructured uh, textual words or just one sentence over here. And how to extract those geographic information from those unstructured uh, textual words. So what Google did uh, is the first thing is it will tokenize uh, those words. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it tokenized into words over here. And then uh, the second uh, is to remove some common words. So from and to is removed. And then uh, remove the words that are not in the geographic uh, dictionary. So flight is removed. So finally, you have the London and Paris. So Google will understand that, OK, so from these unstructured uh, textual words, uh, there are two uh, geographic information. And one is about London, and the other one is about Paris. Okay, so this is how Google extracts the geospatial information out of uh, some uh, unstructured uh, phrases. But however, uh, this type of, um, you can say, uh, extraction uh, of the meaning or, or, or the uh, extraction of the geographic information actually um, is need to dis discuss the semantic uh, issue. 
uh, it needs it needs to discuss the semantic issue. So, for example, uh, right now, uh, if I find uh, the flight from London to Paris, and the next thing I want to do uh, is to find the hotel uh, to stay in the Paris. So, uh, what I can do is uh, I can key in uh, the question. Uh, I want to stay in the Hilton Hotel uh, in Paris. So, I want to, uh, so I search for Paris Hilton, or I search for Paris and Hilton. And so, what I'm trying to look for is this hotel. But however, uh, sometimes uh, I believe uh, for some of you should know that if I key in, uh, if you key in uh, right now, if you key in Paris Hilton on Google, uh, and then uh, okay. you may find you may find another uh, result, which is uh, this person. Uh, this is the Paris Hilton. Uh, it's uh, yeah, you you guys, some of you may know know her. Uh, he's uh, she's a uh, uh, kind of like a celebrity. Uh, well, yeah, kind of like the celebrity. Okay, so, uh, so which means that uh, the same exact uh, keywords that you entered um, on Google, uh, maybe will uh, like parse it differently. And so, how Google uh, can uh, really understand uh, the context of your searching uh, requirement. For example, uh, how does Google know that uh, you are searching for the hotel, or how does Google know that you are searching for uh, this lady? Okay, so uh, that's the semantic issue. Okay, so the geo parsing um, it touches a little bit about the well, it touches the semantic. So uh, the semantic uh, is a little bit oh, well, it's quite uh, deep, not so easy to handle. Okay, I will just stop over there because there are some well, a lot of uh, ideas, uh, a lot of trends uh, that we are going to talk about, and hopefully you can. Um, well, you can. Uh, you, this is kind of serving as the introduction uh, to you guys. And if you are interested in some of the concept, uh, you can take a look by that or dig into the details uh, later on. So the next one is called the map mashup. Okay, so the map mashup is actually quite important uh, to uh, to the web mapping. So uh, to talk about the map mashup, let's talk about the mashup uh, first. So the mashup, uh, the idea mashup, uh, originally uh, was from the music industry, and then uh, the idea for that is to uh, mix uh, two or more songs uh, together uh, to become a new, um, new, new song. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can try to Google it on uh, on, Google, on YouTube. Uh, so, uh, as for example, like you can uh, like mix uh, Adele's um, uh, tune uh, with uh, MM's uh, lyrics. Uh, so. I think it's like that, or Adele. Oh, sorry, Adele's um voice and uh, with the MM's uh like tune. So and then it becomes a new song and quite um I don't know quite uh naturally, uh quite smoothly and it, it's actually out of uh, out of sudden uh it's a it's a new creation. Uh, so the main the idea of mashup is to mix uh the uh, the the content of two different um. Uh, two different data sets or two different source of uh, information and then it becomes a new uh, product. So in terms of the technology, a mashup becomes uh, in, uh, a web application that can combine the data or uh, functionality contents or services from more than one sources. And the map mashup uh, is a combination. Uh, is, the map mashup is uh, easier, actually. Uh, it's actually like putting some geographic data on your map and that becomes uh, the process of the map mashup. Okay, so uh, there are a lot of uh, map mashup examples. So uh, maybe I can ask you one question, uh, or you can think about say, um, when you are using uh, Google Map, are you using the map itself, or are you using the data on the map? Uh, let me repeat it again. So are you? Uh, so I believe uh, most of you use uh, the uh, the Google Map a lot. Uh, and when you are using the Google Map, are you using the map itself? Uh, for example, like satellite images, uh, the 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 street maps, uh, or aerial photos. Uh, are you using those things? Are uh, are you, or are you using the point of interest, or are you using the geographic data on the map? So actually, most users uh, are using both, of course. Um, but however, uh, because you guys are remote sensing researchers, uh, so uh, most of you you are you you analyze the uh, satellite images and you analyze the aerial photos. But however, for general public, uh, but most of them they are using the uh, like the point of interest on the map. Okay, 
So there are a lot of uh, map measure examples. Uh, for example, you can put some uh, sensor uh, observations or sensor data, the buoy data on the map, and then you can like uh, just mouse over, uh, hover uh, to all the, uh, those, sens uh, those stations, and then you can see the real-time uh, readings. Or you can like map the real-time uh, flight, uh, like airplane, uh, the location of airplane on the, on the map, or you can map your uh, friend's location on the map as well. Or you can like digitize uh, the like the whole world on the map. So those are like overlapping those uh, like you can say stream maps on the map. So um, these are the well map mesh examples, and uh, you can try to think about say how to construct these type of application and how to uh, combine the map with other geographic data. How to uh, extract those uh, those information and then uh, parse it uh, in a way that is understandable and then uh, display it in a way that it is uh, intuitive. Okay, so like I said, uh, and oh, the, this one is about the COVID nineteen. So as you can see. Uh, the, there is a timeline uh, below, and then uh, so when you play it, and then uh, you can see there are some dots of uh, like uh, showing everywhere, and then uh, so that's the COVID nineteen uh, like map. So uh, and the trend is over here. Uh, so I believe when you move to here, you will we will see like uh, some circles getting larger and larger. So uh, that's well, that's the pandemic uh, we are getting uh, right now. So that's also one of the map and shop example as well. Okay, so that's the uh, web mapping. Uh, you can say one of the topic that we want to talk about. The next topic I'm going to talk about is the geo web, or uh, in the like the full name for that is the geospatial web. Uh, so uh, let's first talk about the uh, the definition of the geo web. Uh, the geo web is actually quite. Um, have a quite uh, flexible and a little bit vague uh, definition. So uh, uh, the geo, geo web or geospatial web is basically like the collection, the global collection of the services and data that has anything to do with the geographic uh, information. So for example, it could be a data on the web or it could be a service that uh, process, uh, that, that, that process uh, geospatial uh, data. Or it could be a service allow you to search for geospatial data. So any service, any web service, or any uh, data that uh, has geospatial components, that can be count as one part of the geo web. All right, that can be count as one part of the geo web. So it's kind of like a subset of the World Wide Web, and uh, and it kind of like a subset of the World Wide Web. And why is that important? So basically. Uh, you can imagine um, the World Web is basically like uh, if you treat the, uh, the well, World Wide Web is basically like the largest uh, database that um, that we have in the human history. So it's a like a large, uh, a very large infrastructure. It has a large infrastructure from the internet, and then uh, the web actually store a lot of information uh, in the like textual format, in the document format, uh, or uh, like any types of data format. And so, this large amount of uh, database, how to query the data efficiently? So right now, uh, we if we treat it as a database, a World Wide Web as a database, and when how we query this database uh, efficiently, uh, well, uh, usually when you are you, when you want to find something online, then you will go to a search engine, for example, like Google, uh, like uh, uh, Bing or other uh, ser search engines. So you use those search engines allow you to search to query uh, this World, World Wide Web database, and. What I'm trying to say is that this database actually a quite large amount of uh, subset is uh, they, they all contains uh, the geographic information. So how to utilize, how to identify those ge geographic information and how to uh, integrate and retrieve those geographic information uh, for your own domain uh, application. That uh, will be one uh, very important and very, uh, it has a very large potential uh, to the geo geospatial web. 
just uh, let's just assume that I believe most of you or some of you are, uh, for, for example, like um, uh, you can say GIS uh, analysis. Uh, you create some models, uh, for example, landslide model, some typhoon model, uh, that, or you can say, uh, well, which, or surveying. So they, they are, many of you, they are, you, you are doing some uh, geospatial statistics and you create some model. But however, uh, you may think about one question is, um, did you really consider all the variables uh, that uh, would affect your, um, well, would affect your domain uh, model? Did you consider everything? Uh, for example, uh, for landslide model, uh, well, did you consider everything? Uh, for example, that's some common common uh, factors. Uh, of course, you consider that, uh, including the slope, uh, including the, like, uh, for example, rainfall, uh, including the soil uh, characteristics and but how you, and uh, and the fault uh, fault uh, location, and, but however there may be some other uh, well information. For example, what type of what types uh, what types of trees uh, are over there, and uh, and maybe uh, I don't, I don't know uh, ho, ho, uh, the, the river also uh, I believe uh, is commonly uh, like uh, considered. Uh, but however, for example, like how many, uh, how much uh, human activities uh, everywhere, uh, that could also affect, uh, for example, the landslide. So how to make sure that you consider everything uh, when you are developing that model? Um, in my personal opinion, of course, my personal opinion. In my personal opinion, it's very, very difficult to say, oh, I consider everything. Why? Because, well, we don't have the data. Uh, we, we of course uh, all the all the GI, uh, the all the analysis. Uh, we want to we want to consider everything. We want to consider everything uh, uh, to a to a degree that even the butterfly effect can be captured. But however, that's uh, usually not possible because we don't have the access to those data, and maybe those data doesn't exist. But however, uh, think about say the web as the largest uh, database that human being has. Then. If we have the data, then, well, to uh, a higher chance, uh, the highest chance that is we can find those data on the web. And if you cannot find the data on the web, then, well, most of, m most likely you don't have the data. We don't have the data. Uh, so in this case, how to identify those geospatial information and how to utilize them and how, how to integrate them, utilize them, that's the, uh, the issue, um, or you can say the, opportunity uh, to the geospatial web. In my personal opinion, you can say, all right. So um, yeah, here, uh, GeoWeb, why it becomes so important, uh, it's actually similar to uh, like benefits from the concept of the Web 2.0. So I believe some of you may know the Web uh, Web 2.0. Uh, so the, let's just briefly uh, like go over it step by step. So Web 1.0 uh, is like the first generation of the web. And then uh, there, it has another trend called the read-only web. So uh, at that time, at, the, at that period of time, uh, the like, host of the websites are uh, very, you can say, uh, has a barrier or in, the, in terms of the technology. So not everyone can host their website. So most of the content are controlled by some providers. So uh, as you can see, the public contents are like, takes a large amount of the uh, content on the, on, the, on the web. And most of the users, uh, they passively uh, receive those data and consume those data. And only a partial of small fragments of the data or the content are generated by user. So that's the first uh, generation of the web, Web 1.0. And however, to like early uh, 2000s uh, and the Web 2.0 age, uh, it becomes there are a lot of uh, more and more uh, technology and also some platform allow users uh, to contribute information. So uh, you can say that the amount of user generated content getting larger and larger. And till now, I would say uh, we are still in the Web 2.0 age, even though uh, recently uh, some people talk about the three, Web 3.0. And the current Web 3.0 and the uh, and the previous Web 3.0 are quite different. So that's another topic and that, that we don't have the time to talk about. So anyway, so uh, because uh, because of the technology advance, uh, so Web 2.0 allows users to create a lot of content. And even for uh, Times Magazine, Time Magazine, uh, in 2007, uh, well, in every year, uh, at the end of every year, uh, they will select a person of the year. And in 2007, they select you. 
uh, they select you as the person of the year, uh, well, uh, in 2007. So you means everyone on the web, or me, you means everyone on the on the web. Uh, why 2007? Uh, because uh, that's the year that YouTube get uh, viral. Uh, YouTube get very, very popular. So, um, and that is the trend of the web, web 2.0. So there are a lot of uh, Web 2.0 examples, uh, for, and th those are some popular and uh, existing and popular uh, platforms. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Tumblr, Flickr, Wikipedia as well. So those, the content, uh, why you are using those platforms? Because there are a lot of uh, variable and uh, in, uh, uh, good contents on, on those platforms so that you use them. But however, who provides those content to that platform? Users, user provides uh, the the content to that platform so that uh, the the value of those platform getting like higher and higher. Okay, so uh, that's the idea uh, for the Web 2.0. Okay, so and but however, uh, if we talk about say uh, the uh, you can say <clears throat> the problem uh, of the Web 2.0 uh, in terms of the Web GIS. So when user have the capability to generate a lot of geospatial data on the on the web, then in this case, uh, we need to take care of one uh, issue, which is the interoperability. So what exactly is the interoperability? Interoperability. So basically, um, or in case, uh, one important uh, keyword over here is the information portability. So which means that let's just assume uh, they are two people. Uh, they try to communicate with each other, and they are two indiv independent systems. So right now, uh, the B can X, uh, can send a request to A. So B may ask uh, one question to A. Uh, for example, like, uh, well, how's the weather? Uh, that's the question. And when A receives it, um, then it can understand uh, the question and then return a uh, uh, return, uh, response. So maybe the answer could be, uh, it's very cold today. Uh, so the request and response, uh, they will link to the, together. So why A and B uh, can extract in, in information? Because they have the, they are in the same context, or they are in the same context. So uh, the request and response, uh, they can uh, match with each other. So the interoperability means that two independent systems, uh, they can extract information, uh, they, they can exchange information, right? Let me repeat it again. Interoperability means that two independent systems, they can exchange information. That is called interoperability. So to a, to a person, uh, to a people to people, uh, we can, uh, while I'm introducing some uh, information to you, so we are two different, uh, well, me and also you guys are different systems. Why, why am I transmitting some information to you guys and you guys can receive it? Because we have the same context. We are in the context of talking about WebGIS or talking about remote sensing, talking about talking about interoperability. You can say we are in the same context, and then also, besides having the same context, we need to make sure that we have the same standard. Right? We are communicating by using same standard. So interoperability is usually achieved by using standards. So language is one of the standards. So for example, I'm speaking to you guys uh, in English. And so I have the, the I, I am, uh, so me myself learn English and as learning this standard, this language standard. And you guys also learn English as it's a standard. So if the English, we if the English that we understand are the same, so we can communicate with each other. So including the words, uh, and also including the grammar, including the sentence that we learn. If we have the common understanding to the standard, then we can communicate. Okay. So, and if we can, if we as two independent system, we can communicate. Then that means uh, we are uh, we have the interoperability. Okay. So uh, yeah, here uh, to achieve interoperability in the modern world, we define standards. So with the standards, uh, we can plug and play. We can start speaking and uh, transmitting information. So uh, back to the geospatial data. So uh, like I said, uh, with the help of the Web 2.0,
people can generate a lot of geospatial data on the web. And but however, those data, if I, if we want to extract those uh, geographic data and identify them and utilize them. Then one important thing is uh, they should follow standard. Uh, they should follow standard. Otherwise, uh, if it's not following any standard, then it will be difficult to extract the information. Or say you need a customized uh, approach uh, to extract those geospatial data. So uh, standard becomes uh, one important issue for the uh, geo web. So as you can see, uh, there are uh, two categories of the uh, like geospatial data uh, for, uh, for the geo web. One is for the data. Uh, so shear file, uh, OGC KML, OGC uh, GML, or uh, GeoJSON, uh, and those things are, could be for geo, geo PDF, those things, uh, they could be the standard data format. And if it's the web service uh, standard, then it could be uh, OGC WMS, the web map service, uh, OGC WFS, or uh, OS open, open source geospatial TMS, the tile map service. And so those are the web service uh, standards. So web service standards means that uh, it defines the language. Uh, it defines the language uh, of the communication between the client and server. So what the client can send, uh, what's the request the client can send to the server and is defined. And then what the response, the server will respond to client with is defined in the standard. Okay. So these are the important standards. Uh, well, the, 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 that's the important role of standards uh, to achieve the interoperability. Okay. So there are some existing approaches uh, to find the data online, uh, for example, by using the data portals. Uh, but however, there are a lot of data portals uh, and how does user, um, how does an user uh, know uh, he covers all the, all, all the data portal? Uh, so, and how do, how do they know uh, where the data that they want uh, exists? So that's one of the problem. And the other existing approach is by using the spatial data uh, infrastructure, the SDIs. So maybe, uh, for example, like the catalog services, some geospatial resources, uh, they will register those, uh, the data to the catalog services, and the user will go to uh, some catalog service uh, to search for the data, and then to retrieve the data from the, data, from the geo resources. But however, <clears throat> But however, uh, this type of approach also has a problem because, uh, well, uh, the data provider, they need to proactively register the data to catalog services. That's one problem because they don't have any incentive uh, to do that. And the other problem is the user needs still need to query all the, go to all the catalog services uh, to make sure that they search for all the possible uh, geospatial uh, resources uh, online. But however, for a user to query, uh, to, to, to understand uh, all the, uh, to know all the catalog services is not so feasible. And so uh, in this case, uh, users uh, can now find all the uh, geospatial resources uh, from the existing approaches. So in this case, um, in our group, actually, uh, we think that your web and World Wide Web are quite similar. So in this case, uh, the World Wide Web is have it has the search engines uh, to search uh, to serve as the query engine to query the web uh, domain. Uh, the, sorry, to query the web database. And so for the geo web, for the geo web database, uh, we need a geo web search engine. So in this case, uh, actually, I have some stud students, uh, they worked on this topic. Uh, for example, in order to identify all the geospatial data on the web, uh, we create uh, the geo web crawler uh, that can crowd uh, the whole world wide web and to identify the geospatial data. And uh, and of course, uh, this is by according to, according to the standard uh, based uh, data. So after we crawl the da those data, then we can create the rank, uh, uh, ranking algorithm. For example, like Google is important. Uh, Google, why Google is important uh, or it is, um, uh, is easy to use. Uh, it, it's not because they have the crawler name. It's not because they know all the web pages on the web. It's because their ranking algorithm can give you the suitable and uh, 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 and the matched data online that, that, that fits what you need. So the ranking algorithm is something uh, for that. So we can uh, we, we can rank the geospatial data according to the importance and according to uh, how much uh, it fits uh, with uh, your query. Uh, so we analyze the attributes of the data uh, and and and, uh, and uh, the attributes of your query and then provide you a proper ranking. 
And then, uh, but however, uh, geospatial data, actually, uh, they are, uh, you can say, they kind of like um, have some common attributes and then their common attributes, how to share with each other. Uh, we need to semanticize uh, those uh, geospatial resources in terms of their uh, geospatial attributes, temporal attributes, uh, and also phenomena attributes. So, but however, how to have a coherent uh, structure to organize those uh, data. Uh, that's also some, uh, the, uh, some topic that we, uh, we, we work on. And finally, uh, uh, the one of the latest uh, uh, topic it related re uh, is the uh, personalization, the personalization of the uh, your web search engine. So, uh, for example, when you search on Google, uh, if you log in uh, with your Google account, uh, then in this case, Google may uh, well store uh, your search history, and then the next time you search for some new things, uh, it will customize uh, the search result according to your personal interest. So, personalization uh, allow you to find uh, more. Uh, you can say more uh, the, the results that uh, that that may fit uh, better uh, with your personal interest. Okay, so that's also one of the interesting, uh, well, research topic. Okay, okay, so that is the GeoWeb. So let's move on to the next topic, uh, the VGI, Volunteer Geographic Information. Uh, that is also one uh, important, uh, uh, you can say, concept. And then actually, this is, um, Quite popular uh, in like early uh, like in the last uh, you can say ten years uh, it's kind of uh, pretty, pretty important. So uh, to talk about the VGI, actually one of the important um, information to talk about is the citizen science. Uh, is the citizen science the definition of the citizen science is that uh, it could be a scientific project, uh, and in these scientific projects. Volunteers uh, are helping uh, the researchers uh, to do uh, to do some observation, to do some measurement, or to do some computation, and the, those uh, efforts are uh, for the research-related tasks. To give you two examples, uh, one is called iWire. Uh, uh, the iWire actually uh, you can see a three-dimensional uh, like uh, the three-dimensional profile view uh, to a human brain. All right, so this is the, the profile of the human brain scan. And then uh, you can move this uh, profile, and then here is the 2D view. So uh, the iWire is actually asking volunteers uh, to help them to map each of the neurons uh, in the human brain. Okay, so uh, although there are a lot of, uh, although as you can know that there are a lot of um, uh, image processing uh, uh, algorithms uh, allow you to do this uh, kind of like automatically. But however, uh, uh, they they are uh, they, of course. Uh, however, there are some uh, uncertainties and some errors. So uh, in this case, uh, the you can say the brain uh, scientists uh, they uh, have they create this project online. And then uh, if you don't have anything to do on Friday night, then uh, you can log on to this website and then start digitizing the neurons of the human brain. And then that information will contribute back to those brain uh, scientists' uh, research. Okay, and the other example is the Galaxy Zoo. Uh, so when you zoom, uh, look on to the uh, Galaxy Zoo, then you will see a picture of the, uh, you can say, uh, telescope, or right, a space telescope. And you will see some photos of the uh, stars or galaxies. And then uh, the, the, guess, the this website will ask you some multiple choice uh, questions. Uh, so for example, like what's the shape of this star? What's the shape of this galaxy? And you would uh, answer those questions one by one. So um, still, uh, of course, for uh, like imagery, uh, for scientists in the imagery processing, uh, you may th you may think that all right, it's maybe it, it, there it could be possible to uh, use uh, some technology uh, to do some image processing to identify that. Yes, that's possible. Uh, but however, in the past, uh, for uh, you can say uh, some uh, scientists uh, studying the like galaxy, uh, they don't have that type of knowledge, so uh, they utilize uh, these uh, websites for volunteers uh, to contribute their observation, to contribute their time, uh, for them to collect the data that you need uh, to uh, do some, uh, to do their research. So this is the idea of citizen science. Okay, so the VGI, back to the idea, uh, the topic of the VGI. So VGI is actually a part, a type of citizen science. 
But however, uh, VGI, uh, the, 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 this type of CDN size uh, needs to have the geospatial component. Uh, it needs to have the geospatial component. So the VGI was proposed uh, by uh, P uh, Professor Michael Guchow uh, uh, in 2007 before he retired uh, from the UC UCSB, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. So uh, basically the VGI means that uh, it is the, it encourage uh, volunteers uh, to contribute uh, geospatial uh, information, uh, to contribute geospatial information. And there are many uh, examples. For example, like the Wikimapia, uh, for example, like the eBird, uh, for example, like the Tomnot. These are all uh, important and uh, very fun uh, topic. Uh, for example, let's say eBird. Uh, for, uh, eBird is, is also for uh, bird, bird uh, scientists. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, for bird scientists, uh, they are uh, tracking the birds, how they migrate uh, from one uh, continent to another continent, uh, from one place to another place. Uh, it's quite difficult for uh, one research team uh, to track all the species uh, in the world. So uh, the eBird uh, means that uh, you can, if you are bird observer, uh, then when you see a bird outside uh, seeing, and then you can identify how many birds are over there and what type of species of the bird, and uh, is male, female, or uh, how uh, is a uh, like adult uh, or uh, or is a child a bird, and then you can upload those sighting information to eBird, and then those information will be uh, collected and then uh, tr uh, help the sci bird scientists uh, to uh, analyze the bird uh, behavior. Okay, so this is one of the example. Tomnot is another type of exam example uh, for the disaster management. Uh, so if you are interested in that, uh, you can dig into the detail. But because of the time, we need to move on. So, but however, although there are some, the earlier I introduced uh, some fun uh, and interesting topics, uh, but however, the uh, one of the most famous uh, topic uh, in uh, for VGI is the open layer. Uh, sorry, is the open stream map. Uh, it's the open stream map. So open stream map uh, was uh, proposed and created by Steve Cost uh, in the uh, you can say um, in UK. Uh, so uh, the idea uh, of having the open stream map is that. Originally, um, in the, at that time, uh, at that time, in the past, uh, maps are expensive and maps are controlled uh, by governments, so it's not freely available for everyone. So uh, you can try to think about, say, uh, for most of you, for many of you are doing some like uh, analysis. If you don't have the street map, then how does it affect your uh, like research? Uh, some of you, uh, your research uh, like heavily uh, uh, depends on the stream map information. And uh, if there's no freely available uh, data, then uh, you need to apply it from the government or even uh, buy it from the government. And sometimes uh, you couldn't even buy it because uh, there are some sensitive information uh, in the, in, on the map. So um, earlier in the past, uh, maps are controlled by uh, governments. Uh, so Steve Koss uh, recognized this problem and then uh, he started this OpenStreetMap project and encouraged everyone uh, to like digitize. Uh, when you can log on to OpenStreetMap and then digitize uh, the map and, uh, and uh, becomes a vector uh, map data. And then uh, these vector map data are freely available for everyone in the world. You can download the share file uh, and, uh, it, you, and and the map is keep updating uh, uh, every minute. Okay, here are uh, two two videos I want to share with you. Uh, so let me like uh, sorry, let me change the audio uh, first so that you can hear some of the like sounds. Okay, let me change it a little bit. Okay. Okay, uh, so this is the OpenStreetMap two thousand. So uh, okay, this is the OpenStreetMap uh, two thousand eight, uh, a year of edit. This is what they call the flash show, flash, uh, like flash show. So why it's called flash? You can see it early, uh, later on. So uh, so those blink or those those things are what they call uh, what they call the flash. So each of the flash is the edit of the uh, on the OpenStreetMap. So as you can see, uh, there are a lot of edits, uh, and uh, uh, at the uh, you can say uh, bottom left corner, there's a timeline over there. Okay, 
So as you can see, those flashes are means uh, the edits. Uh, so there's a lot of edits uh, in 2008. Uh, every place, uh, uh, all the places uh, in the world, actually, uh, for uh, most of the countries, right? most of the countries, not all of the countries, uh, because OpenStreetMap uh, was banned uh, in some of the countries. Uh, and I'm not going to point out who, which countries. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in that, you can take it by yourself. Uh, there will be some huge parts, uh, they are all black, and those are the parts are banned by those countries. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, someone raise a hand. Uh, let me take a look. Hmm? No? Any question? Anyone has any question? Or click by accident? Okay, if not, uh, okay, so that, uh, they, may, they may move on because we need to rush to finish everything. Okay, so. The next uh, video is actually quite interesting. Um, this is the project Haiti uh, 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 from 2010. So uh, OpenStreetMap actually has some uh, humanitarian, uh, hu humanian, uh, uh, or you can say the disaster um, uh, rescue projects. Uh, when there's a, a, any uh, disaster happens uh, in the world, then uh, they will uh, encourage people to like digitize the maps over there. And the project Haiti, uh, okay, project Haiti. Uh, it, it means that uh, well, uh, there was a large earthquake and also a tsunami uh, in the Haiti city. Uh, so uh, and uh, you can see the how OpenStreetMap reacts to that event. So this it means uh, earthquake and then as you can see a lot of activity uh, start uh, happening uh, to the Haiti city region okay so as you can see that there are a lot of uh, flashes uh, after uh, the earthquake and tsunami and so uh, basically that's the uh, that's everyone in the world everyone on the web uh, digitizing uh, well, all the contributors contributing those their efforts uh, to digitize uh, the maps over there uh, to help the disaster management. So um, uh, what they said is that in three days, uh, the OpenStreetMap has the uh, the most complete uh, electronic uh, map. Uh, well, well, so in th in three days, uh, OpenStreetMap uh, can achieve that, but uh, it's not because of OpenStreetMap, uh, or you can say, it's not um, because of the staffs uh, in the OpenStreetMap, it's because all the contributors uh, are using OpenStreetMap to contribute. So that's the power of VGI. Okay, here are some statistics of the VGI. Uh, I don't think we have the time to go over that in detail, so you can take it by yourself. Uh, one of the most important thing is that uh, OpenStreetMap uh, changes uh, every minute. All right, OpenStreetMap changes every minute. Okay, and to handle that from a computing perspective, uh, OpenStreetMap needs to handle, uh, need to design their system in a way that can accept uh, those high, uh, those high frequency updates. Uh, and so uh, they have some certain design, and this is just a graph of their system, uh, so architecture of their system. And I'm not going to dig into dig into the detail. Uh, if you are interested in that, you can dig in, you can take a look by yourself. Okay, but however, OpenStreetMap has uh, one concern, which is the quality, because the uh, geospatial information are contributed by uh, users and volunteers. Uh, so in this case, um, how to make sure the data quality is good enough uh, to be applied uh, in, in in other uh, in certain application domain? Uh, and in 2010, uh, one of the researchers, uh, he uh, compared the OpenStreetMap data to the UK official uh, data. And uh, they find out on average, uh, the precision uh, accuracy is within six meters. And, over, uh, and about 80% of the roads are, are uh, overlapped, uh, or you can say 80% of the roads are have been uh, discovered uh, by the OpenStreetMap uh, volunteers. So in, in this case, as you can see, it gives you uh, one certain um, idea uh, that how good or how bad the OpenStreetMap data is and how you could apply it for some certain application uh, level. 
Okay, so, uh, but still, uh, it still has some uh, data quality issue. For example, like this is where I work. Uh, this is the NCU CSR SR center. And then in fact, we have two buildings over here. Uh, and and uh, there's a, like uh, uh, a link between these two buildings. Uh, but however, uh, on OpenStreetMap, uh, uh, people uh, only use, uh, volunteers only use one polygon to indicate that uh, here is the, uh, the CSR SR building. So, but, well, uh, it's not accurate enough uh, for some application, but well, for to some application is quite enough, you can say. Okay, so let's move on to the next topic, uh, which is the LBS, location-based service. Uh, so uh, the location-based service is quite, um, you can say easy to understand. Um, so basically the location-based service uh, is uh, an application uh, that provides you customized services it provides you customized services uh by using one essential information which is oh sorry which is the uh location of the user or location of the device okay so let me repeat it again so the lbs means that uh, it's an application that use the location of the user as the essential parameter to provide customized or personalized services Okay, so uh, it's, uh, there are some easy to understand examples. Let's just directly go to the examples. Um, one of them uh, is uh, the well search for nearby events, business, or people. For example, like uh, they, uh, for for example, let's just take a look at this uh, example. At the very early urge age of the idea of the locate the term location based service uh, was proposed. Uh, one of the uh, most signature um one of the signature application is called the four square or uh, it's called the four square right now not many people are using that uh, but however once upon a time it was uh, it, it was pretty popular uh it's not as popular as pokemon go uh but however it's quite uh quite popular at that time so the four square actually is a uh is a platform allow you to check in all right allow you to allow you to check in for example like facebook and also has the checking uh Facebook, Twitter, uh, they have the, this type of checking uh, capability. And uh, in terms of the Foursquare, uh, it helps you to tracking at the certain restaurant, certain store, and the more you're tracking, and then the more uh, points that you can get. And then uh, the more points you can get, then uh, you can collect some badges, uh, some badges. And finally, you can become the mayor of the store, all right, the mayor of the store. So at that time, um, uh, some restaurant, uh, they have some, uh, you can say, uh, some uh, uh, discounts uh, for, uh, they will say, okay, so if you show me your Foursquare uh, uh, profile, and then if you are the uh, mayor of my restaurant, then I would give you how much discount. For example, I, you will get a free drink or you will get 90%, uh, 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 get, get, you will get 10% uh, off, for example, like that. So why? Because uh, you're checking a lot over there so that means uh, you must uh, visit that restaurant a lot. So that's the case. Uh, so uh, once upon time, once upon a time, that was a pretty uh, famous LBS example. Uh, so uh, why is LBS? Uh, because uh, it's utilizing the location of the device and location of the user uh, for that. And uh, finding the restaurant, finding the uh, like ATN, and finding your friends or celebrity as well. Uh, so, for example, there's a, something called star sighting. When you see a star, some celebrity, and you can uh, go to this website and then uh, to post, say, okay, so I see, I don't know, Justin Bieber <laughs> uh, somewhere, and then uh, so uh, you can share that uh, sighting uh, over there, and then everyone will see that. Uh, it's a little bit creepy, so um, I'm not encouraging you guys to do that, uh, but however, uh, that's one of the LBS uh, application. Uh, okay, that's, uh, the, but however, there's one uh, pretty interesting one, uh, which is called the mobile advertising. So uh, one is called Where Ads. <clears throat> This one, uh, this one is actually um, a, 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 an application that uh, if you install that uh, into your uh, device and then you turn on the LBS service, 
and then when you like walk on the street and then um, and suddenly your, your phone will get some notification and then uh, say uh, and the notification may say okay so uh, 500 me uh, meters ahead uh, there was there is a store uh, it has a flash sale and then uh, it has uh, like 30 percent off or 50 percent off and then uh, it will just directly show up on your cell phone and because you are just nearby, all right. Because you are just nearby, so uh, you may be uh, like easily attracted uh, and uh, to to the to to take a look because you are just nearby. And then if you are not uh, rush in time, then uh, you can just uh, and usually people will uh, get attracted. So uh, once upon a time, uh, it's quite it's pretty uh, famous. Uh, this mobile advertising uh, is quite famous, and I think right now it's quite famous as well. And I think whereas uh, is acquired by one of the big company, I think it's uh, Paul, uh, PayPal. I think it was uh, uh, acquired by PayPal. Uh, uh, I, I forgot by, uh, by by how much uh, money, but however, it was. I, I think it's uh, acquired by PayPal. Oh, uh, I think it's more than one hundred a million. All right. Uh, so it, it, it was acquired by uh, PayPal by uh, uh, more than 100 million uh, US dollar. So as you can see, uh, it's a quite a big uh, business over there. Okay, other LBS examples. Uh, one of the easiest one uh, is the turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Uh, so like Google Map, Google Map has the turn-by-turn -turn, uh, navigation. And But however, here I didn't put the Google Map. Instead, I put Wes. Uh, this is one interesting uh, uh, navigation tool, uh, uh, and uh, it was a, a startup company uh, in Israel. Uh, uh, and later on, uh, uh, well, well, this turn-by-turn uh, -turn navigation, uh, it, the the special part of it is that users uh, can contribute the information. A little bit similar, I, I think Google is doing that as well. But however, uh, West do it more is explicitly. All right, so uh, you can when you are driving on on, on the road, and then you are if you are using Waze, and then uh, if you are in you, you, you hit a traffic jam, and then you can click uh, to uh, like click and click and report that okay, so here on this street, the uh, traffic is very bad, is heavy traffic over here, and if other user uh, other user is also using uh, the Waze, and then. Uh, Originally, uh, he was uh, the West tell the user to go to the same uh, street, same road. But however, because you uh, report uh, that here is a very heavy traffic jam, so the next uh, user will receive that information, and then the West may tell that user to take an uh, alternative uh, route to save more time. So uh, that's what use what West uh, does. Okay, so uh, and also also uh, there's one interesting one, uh, which is well we don't have time, but however uh, that's interesting one. Uh, so uh, on Wes, uh, when you see a police car uh, hidden uh, somewhere to take some photo uh, to measure your uh, speed uh, of your of your car of your driving, um, then you can click and click and report that here at this location uh, there's a police uh, over there. So. Uh, why I say it's interesting because uh, it happens to me uh, when I was driving in Canada. So uh, when I was driving in Canada, then uh, well, I used uh, at that time was was just released, and I was using it. And then uh, when I suddenly I suddenly get a notification, uh, say 500 meters ahead there's a police car. Then but when I drive uh, over there and I didn't see that I didn't see any police, but uh, when I pass through a bridge, then I I, I see there's a police car hidden behind uh, the bridge. So um, that means uh, people are really using uh, Wes at that time. I, um, but well, right now, uh, I think there are still people using it. Um, but however, they, uh, Wes uh, was acquired by Google uh, later on. So uh, it's already in Google uh, business. Uh, they still uh, didn't shut it down, but however, uh, well, it's still, uh, uh, the, the relationship between Wes and Google Map uh, is a little bit, well, I don't know. Uh, not so transparent to me. Uh, so um, you can uh, take, you can keep an eye on that uh, uh, in terms of how it will go. Okay. So uh, there are other things. Uh, we don't have the time to talk about everything. Uh, for example, like games, uh, location-based service, uh, games uh, like the Pokemon Go, or these, uh, or uh, what uh, before the Pokemon Go, uh, that was the Google's ingress. Uh, that's also 
um, are kind of similar to Pokemon Go, but however, more complicated and, and a little bit more fun to some people. Okay, so the OBS has a privacy issue. Uh, so basically, um, uh, this is an interesting one. So uh, there was a service uh, provided, uh, created by some people, and uh, it's called Please Rob Me. So uh, I believe many of you has checking on the Facebook, on Twitter, on some places. So when you're checking online, um, you share some information. You, you tell people that uh, at this time you are at this location. But however, you also tell people that at this time you are not at a certain, uh, you are not at other locations. For example, you are not at home. So, uh, so when you are, when you check on checking online, then uh, some people may know that, okay, so Right now, your house may be empty, and then they can go like try to break into your house and then steal some variable properties, uh, something like that. So uh, that's a privacy issue. So next time, uh, when you check, uh, when you're checking on online, uh, uh, maybe maybe well, think uh, take some uh, second thought. Okay. Finally, uh, we still have a little bit of time to talk about the IoT, the internal things. Uh, so IoT is also one part of the WebGIS uh, and it's an important part in my personal opinion. So uh, I believe right now you guys uh, should know uh, some idea about IoT. At the very beginning of IoT, don't, people don't know what that is. So, uh, and uh, there are a lot of definitions online, but right now it's getting converged. Uh, and uh, one of the popular, uh, like, uh, uh, definition that I found uh, is suitable is from the International Telecommunication Union. And so uh, it defines that the uh, Internet of Things is a global infrastructure uh, that can help to interchange, uh, interconnecting physical and virtual things and by using interoperable uh, ICT technology, information and, co te and communication technology. So uh, basically that's the uh, inter IoT, that's the IoT. So it helps to interconnect the physical things and virtual things. Uh, so, and uh, the things, what could be the things? Uh, it could be the physical things in the physical world. Uh, it could be the, uh, like the, you can say uh, the washing machine. Uh, it could be the monitor, the TV. It could be the coffee machine. Uh, it could be the lamp. Uh, so those, uh, or you, it could be the chair. Uh, it could be your car, for example. So everything uh, in the physical world, it could be a thing uh, in the IoT field. And it could also be a virtual thing. Uh, for example, uh, it could be a class, or it, it could be, uh, for example, uh, for example, our we as a group could be a virtual thing, and, uh, it, uh, and maybe your house uh, could be also a virtual thing as well. So uh, anyway, so basically, the thing was defined uh, as the physical things and virtual things, and their uh, communication between each other uh, becomes uh, the importance of the IoT, the important, the important uh, feature of the Internet of Things. So uh, here's the uh, architecture uh, from the, uh, for, for the IoT. I don't have time to talk about that uh, in detail, but if you are interested in knowing uh, what's the definition from the ITU uh, uh, definition, then you can take a look at their report. Okay, so let's talk about, the, talk about the IoT from two aspects. One is the architecture and the other one is the capabilities. So in terms of the architecture, the high level IoT architecture includes the device level, includes the gateway level, and includes the web service level. So the device, uh, it could be separated to two types. One is the non-resource constrained device and the other one is resource constrained device. So why they are important? Because uh, if it's non-resource constrained device, uh, then that means it has stable uh, power supply and it has the uh, enough computing power so it can directly communicate with the web service. And web service uh, it, uh, supports the IoT resource man management and interfacing. And and for the resource constraint device, uh, it needs it cannot directly communicate with the web service. And in this case, the device needs some help from the local gateway. And gateway serve as the intermediate uh, between the device and services. And so uh, you can exchange information between web service and device uh, through the gateway. Okay, so the communication protocol between the gateway and device may be using some low power uh, cons uh, low power consumption consumption communication protocols. Or communication networks, you can say. And finally, the final layer uh, is the application layer. So uh, the services or specific use cases utilizing the modules of uh, localizing the, uh, the resources on the web service. 
Okay, so that's the high-level IoT architecture. So, and then in terms of the IoT capabilities, uh, usually here I will stop and ask you one question, which is if right, right now you have the ability to link one thing, one physical thing, one anything uh, to the internet that has not been linked to internet before, then which thing that you will link? For example, um, uh, you may, uh, so don't tell me that you want to link your cell phone to the internet. It's already linked. All right, so don't tell me like that. So what is that hard thing that it has not been linked to the internet? And you, right now you have the ability to link that to the internet. So what is the thing that you want to do? What do you want to link? And why? Why do you want to link it? Okay, because of the time, uh, you can think that while well, privately, <laughs> so in your in your mind. But however, right now we need to move on. So IoT capability, it has two main capabilities. Some people may link something uh, to the internet because it wants to understand the stat uh, status of that thing. For example, uh, I believe most of you has the experience that when you go to uh, go outside and then uh, suddenly in the middle of the suddenly in the middle of uh, 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 on the road, then you think that, or you suddenly, uh, like, well, uh, uh, wondering if you, re if you lock your door or not, if you have locked uh, your door, uh, door or not. So I believe most people happen uh, uh, have this experience. So the sensing capability, if the door is linked to the uh, internet, then through the internet, you can see the status uh, of the door, whether it's locked, or unlocked, okay? Or you can uh, link, uh, you, if you want to link your chair uh, to your to the internet, uh, so why? You want to maybe measure the uh, how much weight uh, that this chair is uh, suffering from, and uh, maybe you are to, uh, the, the, and to monitor the weight of your uh, body, and then, uh, then uh, uh, you can find out that uh, you need to cut some uh, weight, uh, uh, for, for example, like that. Or uh, the other purpose is uh, maybe that chair is going to bro uh, break uh, soon. Uh, so you need to prepare some money to repair it or to buy a new chair. So the uh, it may be using some surrounding or embed uh, sensors uh, um, uh, of that uh, device. And you want to get those information. So sensing capability is for that. Uh, of course, some uh, some uh, one of the students mentioned that uh, he wants to con uh, he, she wants to connect uh, the uh, like environmental sensors. Of course, uh, that's one of the capability from the IoT. It connects to the uh, embedded um, sensors as well. The next capability is the tasking capability. So the tasking capability allows uh, uh, users to remotely control it. For example, back to the uh, door uh, door uh, example. So if you find out by sensing capability, you find out the door has not been locked, and then if you then uh, one thing is. If you uh, find it out, you need to go back to um, to lock it, but that will take a lot of time. So, uh, if the door is linked to the uh, the internet, and maybe you can use some actuator to remotely lock the door, uh, then that is the tasking capability. Or right, that is the tasking capability. So there are a lot of capability mentioned by uh, many people uh, for the IoT. But however, if you try to uh, like uh, uh, digging dig into the details, then you may, you may find out that uh, those capabilities are the mesh up between the sensing capability and the testing capability. Okay, so uh, one of the earliest uh, sensing capability, um, we don't have the time to talk about that in detail, but however, one of the most uh, earliest sensing capability is from the Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, that's the Coke vending machine. Uh, so uh, some students are re, uh, you can say, um, they uh, modify that machine and so that they can monitor um, how much uh, cook uh, was uh, was in the uh, in the machine and uh, is it cold enough uh, to buy it uh, so that's uh, well the, their purpose uh, to re they are lazy students uh, they want to know uh, how much cook they have uh, uh, in the machine uh, remotely so that uh, they can decide whether they want to spend the time uh, and energy to walk to the machine okay so that's their purpose and that was one of the earliest uh, sensing capability. 
And one of the earliest uh, testing capability is the Internet Toaster, uh, created by John Rumke uh, in uh, 2000, uh, in, in, uh, 19, uh, uh, in 1990. So uh, he present this Internet Toaster uh, in the Interrupt uh, Conference. So actually, he um, like create the, this toaster by communicating uh, the, the, to the toaster by using the TCP/IP uh, protocol, and you can remotely uh, turn on and off uh, the toaster. And uh, so uh, actually, it, it was there was a fun story uh, behind it. Uh, so uh, he took the challenge from the organizer of the interrupt and uh, and, and uh, to 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 uh, present. Uh, internet connected appliance and then finally he present this so the first version uh, of the internet toaster has a funny story which is although you can turn it on and off uh, remotely by using the internet but however you need to put the toast uh, to the to, you need to put the bread into the toaster by yourself manually so um, whether it is uh, like uh, I don't know uh, whether it's effective or not, um, well you can decide it. So, but however, is um, one of the earliest uh, testing capability uh, ever found. You can say. And here is the physical mashup. Uh, actually, the, the idea of the physical mashup is to mash between uh, to to mash up uh, between the the sensing capability and testing capability from uh, different. Um, uh, IoT devices, uh, you can say, and then uh, to create something new applications out of it. Uh, here, actually, we have uh, one video, uh, but however, we don't have that much time. So let me just move to one of the places, uh, one of the, uh, okay, one of the parts. So uh, it's a smart home, you can say. It's a smart home. So you can just assume that uh, all the, uh, all the uh, appliance, uh, they are internet uh, connected devices. So like microwave uh, and other things. And uh, so also, for example, like uh, the carpet. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, the carpet uh, is also an IoT device. It has a sensor to record when is the last time that it has been recorded. And then uh, it, it, uh, it will communicate with the vacuum and the vacuum will check the power, uh, the battery level uh, of itself. And then uh, you can uh, ask the, uh, the, the the vacuum to clean it up automatically. Uh, and so so the vacuum will go to go there and clean it up. And here is the fun part. Uh, so far, we also say that it needs to be cleaned. And the vacuum say uh, it's not his, uh, not its business. Uh, so uh, that's a different story. Okay. So anyway, um, that's uh, one of the parts that I want to show you uh, to uh, to uh, you can say to indicate uh, to demonstrate the uh, application of the physical main shop uh, to demonstrate that. So uh, as you can see, carpet using the sensing capability to understand something, and then the uh, to and the vacuum use the testing capability uh, to clean it up. So that's the mashup between the sensing capability from one IoT device uh, and the testing capability from another device. And after meshing them up, it becomes a new application. Okay. So, uh, and then, so basically in summary, sensing capability can help us to understand everything that happened before or is happening right now, or you can build some model based on those sensing observations uh, to anticipate uh, what will happen uh, in, the, in the future. And in terms of the tasking capability, it can help us to achieve smarter applications, more automatic, more efficient, more sustainable, more productive, more secure applications. Uh, so that's what the tasking capability uh, can help us to achieve. So there are a lot of potential IoT applications. I don't want to go through them, so you can take it by yourself because uh, I'm, run, I'm already run out of time. So uh, as you can see, uh, IoT could be applied uh, for the smart city, smart homeland, uh, smart environment, uh, agriculture, and uh, farming as well, and industry 4.0, smart logistics, uh, smart home, and also heat e health. So there are a lot of potential IoT applications. Um, there are some problems of IoT, but we don't have the time to talk about that. Uh, it's a heterogeneity problem, or in short, uh, or in other words, it's the interoperability issue. So, uh, in order to achieve uh, the the vision of like that, uh, the different IoT devices uh, they can uh, communicate with each other, like the carpet uh, and the vacuum. Uh, so, you need uh, to achieve the interoperability by having standards. Right, by having standards. So um, the, we need some open IoT infrastructure to achieve that. Uh, so the, all the communication, they need to follow standards so that they can understand and exchange information uh, between each other.
So uh, here we don't have the time to talk about the Taiwan IoT cyber infrastructure. So you can take a look by yourself if you are going to get the slides. Uh, so I'm going to like skip it uh, over here. Okay, so um, uh, there are already some open standard uh, IoT uh, observations online and, and freely available for everyone. And it's already standard based. Uh, it's the code uh, Taiwan IoT, uh, well, Taiwan Civil IoT. Okay. Okay, so there are some researchers uh, also from my group. Uh, so you can take it by yourself if you have, if you will receive the slides. Uh, we do a lot of um, research in terms of the IoT, and we do some applications uh, in terms in terms of agricultural monitoring. Uh, we build some sensors. Uh, we build some sensors uh, for the indoor uh, environmental monitoring uh, by using some open source hardware uh, to monitor the temperature, humidity, and also the PM two point five uh, for the indoor. Uh, so that's uh, my group. Uh, we are constructing those sensors uh, 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 as a group. And then finally, we deploy those sensors uh, in the like Taipei city government uh, to monitor their uh, indoor environment. Uh, and we can uh, integrate uh, those sensors, uh, the IoT sensors uh, with the uh, 3D uh, city models uh, and to retrieve the real time, near, uh, to retrieve the real time observations based on that. And uh, and also here is uh, one simulation uh, for the indoor fire uh, evacu evacu evacuation system. Uh, so we simulate uh, the fire in the uh, Unity, uh, and then you can control the avatar over here. And by linking uh, the IoT devices, IoT observations uh, with the uh, indoor navigation route and also the city uh, the the city model, uh, then we can decide what's the uh, what's the um, you can say uh, uh, evacuation uh, route uh, that the user needs to take. Uh, for example, we can show uh, some uh, like uh, instructions on the floor, uh, so to uh, indicate that where uh, these uh, where you should uh, leave, uh, where you should uh, evacuate. So that's one of the example that we did. And here is also one other thing, uh, which is also the fire evacuation system. Uh, but however, we implemented uh, in uh, in the real real life, you can say. So uh, we can identify the the uh, the near uh, the shortest path uh, to uh, evacuate. And then here we are using a hair dryer uh, to blow on the uh, on the sen uh, the temperature sensor. And then uh, so when you reach to a certain uh, to, to a certain uh, temperature, then uh, then you will have the warning, and then uh, you will the automatically uh, the uh, e evacuation uh, uh, route uh, will change uh, automatically to tell you where is the route that you should take. And the yellow dot uh, means uh, where the fire could be, and then so you need to take which route. Okay. So uh, because of the time, I need to move on to fin we need to wrap it up. Uh, so as you can see, hopefully through this is the final slide you can say. Um, so hopefully through today's topic, uh, uh, you can have some basic knowledge to the uh, G web GIS and also also have some uh, idea about uh, viewing GIS from a computing uh, system perspective. And also uh, hopefully you can see uh, there are some uh, there are a lot of. Uh, uh, near uh, new uh, technology advances uh, related to GIS and also web GIS and uh, and from a perspective of uh, computing uh, how to realize those um, how to utilize and realize those uh, technology uh, is actually one very fun topic and uh, so there are other research challenges and opportunities uh, that maybe you can explore uh, including the digital twin uh, the idea of the digital twin uh, which is a little bit similar to the IOT and AR, VR, MR, also some visualization technology can be also utilized with the uh, GIS and web GIS as well. And AIoT, the AI plus the AIoT, IoT, edge computing, far computing, and blockchain uh, with the IoT. Those are some research challenges and opportunities uh, related to the GIS, in my personal opinion. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, you can also take a look. Or uh, if you want to uh, t discuss more detail, feel free to contact me. Okay, so uh, I think that will be everything I prepared. Uh, we rushed through a lot of things, uh, but however, uh, thank you for your passion, and uh, hopefully you can learn something uh, today. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, uh, Mengzi, uh, are you here? Yeah. Okay, so okay. I'm finished. Okay, thanks for Professor Huang. And uh, today's class, 
Iya. Oke. Okay. Yo, please write down your answer. That's word to the quest. Use this QR code or link. Thank you.